There was once an explorer, a young man in South America who was looking around for a career for himself, how to earn a living, how to support himself. And living in South America with his beautiful mountains and jungles, vast, you've seen a map of the Amazon, haven't you? What a vast area it is. And he lived in a city at the edge of the jungles and mountains. And the idea came to him that maybe he could become a professional guide, professional explorer, because he had noticed how many people come from all the other countries and from Brazil land itself, how they came to explore for oil, for gold, for trees, rare wood. So it occurred to him, maybe I could become a professional guide. Some of these delegations or individuals come to the Amazon to find what they want to find, wild animals, for example. I could become a professional guide and take them up and they'll pay me for it and I'll make a living. It's something I like to do because he, he loved the outdoors. So he probed around, read books on it, and finally set himself up, still a young man, set himself up as a professional guide for anyone who wanted to penetrate the jungle safely and come out safe again. And he took good, uh, good care of his of his uh, clients as they came in and began taking a few at the beginning. Took them into the jungle, showed them how to camp. Having studied geology and uh, biology, he knew all the plants and all the animals. He knew all about it. He prepared himself. He was using his mind properly for his profession. So this went on and on over the years, bringing people from all countries into the jungle, helping them find what they wanted to find. They came out and they paid him well because he had prepared himself, used his mind properly. He became a very adequate professional guide. And as the years passed, his fame and his fortune grew because he charged a lot of money. He put a lot of time in his uncollege work to learn his craft. He charged them a lot of money for it, and they were willing to pay because when they went in there, they found the oil or the mahogany or whatever they wanted, the silver, and they came out wealthy themselves. So he demanded and got a lot of money for it. He became very wealthy. He became very famous, too. Uh, magazines wrote him up. And he was on interviewed on television. He became a very famous man. And his life was satisfying. Money, fame, anything he wanted. Life was great, exciting. Life was real exciting. Especially because his reputation was so unique. Anyone wanted to go into the jungle, they came to him. And when they came to him, he naturally could set the price, which was always very high. And he, and he liked that part in particular, where he could dictate what they should pay him for guiding him into the jungle. He liked that part very much. $50,000 for three weeks or whatever. He felt very powerful, and he liked that very much. He grew a little older. He grew toward middle age a little bit, and began to notice something inside himself, which was that he wasn't quite as energetic and healthy as he had been when he was younger. And he didn't think of whole lot about it because you grow a little older, you slow down, the body slows down a little bit in most people, unawakened people. So he didn't notice it much, but he did occasionally catch a glimpse of the fact that he was getting tireder a little bit earlier than he used to on some of the treks into the jungle. He went to bed earlier and didn't have the energy that he used to have. Still didn't pay any attention to it. But he began to pay very strict attention to it one time when a call came from an oil company who wanted him to guide them into some territory where oil would be explored, the possibility of finding oil in the ground. He got a call from him, and the, for the first time in his life, he said, I'm sorry, I can't go. I'm just not feeling well today. I can't take on the assignment. And that hurt him real bad because his fees being what they were, he had to give up several thousand dollars to turn it down. 
So he became conscious of the fact that his health wasn't what it used to be, and it prevented him from having the demand for $50,000 to lead the expedition. So now he was conscious of the fact that he wasn't healthy, as healthy as he used to be. So he decided, well, if I'm going to continue to be the world's greatest guide into the Amazon, I better start paying attention to my physical body, to my health, and keep it up. So he visited a doctor or two, visited a psychiatrist or two. He read health books. He went on diets. He took vitamins. He did everything possible to revive his health, which he sensed was going down the hill. But he began to feel as if it was useless, that something was going on inside him that all the doctors and all the vitamins and all the consultations couldn't cure. And this scared him. And he was, he was jolted a little bit out of his daily routine of being all excited about what the day was going to bring, his importance and his gigantic fees. And the more he worried, the sicker he got. And the sicker he got, the more he worried. And the more he went to doctors and read books, but nothing happened. His health just deteriorated, little, little by little. And he had to give up, little by little, his practice of leading people into the jungle. And when this happened, the story ceased to appear in the paper, and he ceased to be on television, and his reputation and his income began to fall. And he was suddenly aware that his life, his whole life, the life as he had known it up to this point, <coughs> was falling apart. It scared him terribly, and he didn't know what to do. That was the worst thing. When his health first started to deteriorate, he knew what to do. You consult people, you go to doctors, you take vitamins, you try to do something about it, but he had done all those things, and what do I do next? What do I do next? And he didn't know the answer. From somewhere, he didn't know where it came from, but he heard the rumor over and over over here one month and six months later he heard it again till it finally hit his consciousness and what the rumor was all about was all about a healing herb that grew somewhere way back nobody knew where in the forest in the jungles in the mountains that there was a, a very rare healing magic herb that healed people where doctors couldn't where books couldn't, or so-called positive thinking couldn't. So he latched on to that as a hope. He said, ah, everything else has failed me. Maybe this is my last hope, but I'm sure going to hang on to it to see where it takes me. And then, as he inquired around, while well, lots of people, lots of people have heard, had heard about it the healing herb, the rare herb. They didn't know where it was. And again, if you'll picture in your mind a map of the, of the Amazon of Brazil, how immense it is, how am I going to find it? If it exists, I'm not sure it exists. It's just a rumor after all. What a, what a double, double blow. If it exists in the first place, and it may not, and if it does exist, can I find it? How can I, one, one little individual, as expert as I am in finding oil and gold for other people, this is something different, this is something new. How can I find a very rare herb way deep in the jungle? But he said to himself, I have to go. I have to travel, I have to find it. And look, I'm middle aged now. What are my chances of finding it in the next few years, soon, when I, be, when I need it? That wasn't the worst thing. I'm going to set out and find this 
healing herb. I'm going to set out and find it, and nobody's going to pay me a cent. All I had to do before was to sit in my home there, and the telephone would ring, or a letter would come, and someone would offer me $50,000 to take the journey into the mountains, and I'd get paid for it. I always got paid for it. Now I, I demand my payment. What if I demanded those people paid? I was somebody. No one's going to pay me a cent. As a matter of fact, this trip, this journey, I'm going to have to pay all my own expenses. It's going to come out of my pocket. I am going to have to give up something. Instead of getting something from other people, I am going to have to give up something of my own possessions. This is what hurt worst of all, because he was somebody at one time. When I have to start reaching in my own pocket, I'm nobody. I can't, I can't depend on anything out there. I have to depend on myself, and I don't like that at all. Nevertheless, it was, it was search or continue to degenerate. So he started out, and I am, of course describing to you the spiritual journey. So he started out, and the, the hardships were incredible. The worst one, and you listen to this, you seekers, the worst one is of tens of thousands of square miles of jungles and rivers and storms and mountains and crevices and valleys and wild animals. Where is it? The healing herb about as wide as one foot to be found in all that immense jungle that even on a map dominates the whole map, all that greenery. It start off or die so he started off all alone. Nobody was with him. The oil company wasn't with him. The gold company wasn't with him. All those enthusiastic animal hunters weren't with him. Nobody wanted to go with him. And he even tried, even tried tricking people into going with him, with him by telling them about the healing herb and saying, this is good for you, but nobody wanted it. Nobody was interested. Nobody would hire him. Even his tricks that he used to try to have someone go with him and pay him didn't work until he finally left all alone. So he went on and on and on for many, many years, suffering, wanting to go back. But how can he go back to the doctors and the books and the diets and the vitamins and the pills? He knew one thing for sure, he couldn't go back to that. And yet, how, how am I going to find it if it exists? I don't even know if it exists. I thought the solution existed in the doctors and the pills, and that didn't. Maybe this is another myth. Maybe I've been foolish to listen to that rumor, story, that there's a healing herb, a very rare herb out there somewhere in the jungle. Oh, and the hatred. And the violence that was in that man as he proceeded, as he explored, as he searched. The violence at what fate had done to him. At what had happened to him. Years, years, years passed. He couldn't go back. That was the whole thing. So he kept looking and searching, hoping. Till late one afternoon, his strength was gone, and there he was thousands of miles apart from his home base, from his home and from civilization, no help. If he grew sick and died out there, he would die out there, no one to help him. And he hadn't found the herb yet, if it existed. 
so late one afternoon, he sighed, and the, the feeling went through him that he wanted to just lay down and die and get it over with. A very strong urge said to him, that'll solve your problem. Just lay down and die. That will solve your problem. Don't you see that that's the solution? And just, he began to sag just a little bit in obedience to what the voice was saying. And something stopped him right, right in the middle of his sagging down to lie down and die. Because he scented something in the air. And you know what it was, don't you? He scented something that was unique, something that he knew. No one ever had to tell him. It was instinctive. It was natural. He knew that he was just a short distance away from the healing herb. And when he scented the fragrance of the herb, he jerked up and he stood up. He sagged one inch. He scented the herb. He jerked up fast, recovered that inch, stood up again. And with great emotion, with great power, with great victory, he heard himself saying something else in contradiction, contrary to what he said the first time. First time the, the voice, he was talking to himself, and the voice said, lay down and die. The second voice was utterly different. And he said to himself, he shouted to himself, <clears throat> I am not going to lay down and die. He knew, he knew where that power came from, not from himself. It came from a realization, it came from the knowledge, the, the sure knowledge that the healing plant was right next door, just a few feet away. He knew, see, listen, you are, you're following me, I know you are, the power to shout out, no, I'm not going to lay down and die. I'm not. That wasn't him talking. It was him that said, I'm going to lay down and give up. This was something else talking inside of him, inspired by something that was outside of him. And he didn't, because he knew what he had to do was just take a few more steps, and he found it. And he found the herb, and he consumed it. He knew that he had his health back. He knew he had his strength back. He could walk through 10,000 jungles to get back to his home base. He knew he was restored. And when he went back, healthy, recovered, a different man, he took down all his advertising signs and he canceled all, all uh, interviews with him as being a famous guide. And he sat quietly in his home and began to tell a few people what few there were around about the rare herb, about the healing herb. Not famous anymore, not rich anymore. <laughs> it has no meaning anymore. He knew the real meaning of life. So it, when you put it in words, it sounds so simple. And you know that nobody else is going to under... You know that nobody is going to understand you. His new meaning of life was to be whole, was to be healthy. All right, if that isn't clear, ladies and gentlemen, he could say to his class, I will tell you that to be really healthy is to be in a different condition than you now are. I can't tell you what condition I am in. There's no way you can grasp it. You would have to be me. You would have to have what I have in order to understand. But as a start, just as a start, you can see what condition you are in now. Look at all of you. Look at all of you. He's saying to the few people, come. you came here for healing, and I know that, that you're even jealous of me for being a famous 
former famous guide, and you, there's a large part of you that still would like to know my secret so you could become a famous guide. I'm trying to tell you something different, that you don't need it. You're going to waste your life as I did unless you listen to me. Now you listen to me and I'll tell you. There is a healing around. It's for you. You're sick. But you can be healed if you'll do what I tell you to do. And I'm telling you, you're not paying me. And there's nothing you can give me. You don't have a thing for me. Nothing. But I'm telling you this because this is the real pleasure of my new life, just to talk about these things. And to tell you that the herb is out there somewhere and I can't guide you to it. I can tell you that it's out there and I can give you lots of elementary help. And I'll walk out to you with the edge, to the edge of the jungle where it begins. And I'll tell you, I can tell you everything you need to know. I can tell you, for example, that you think that you're in danger when you enter that jungle alone. You're not in danger at all. You're in danger being here in what is called civilization with all its insanity. You're safe in the jungle because your intention is right. I'll tell you. I passed through all the dangers, all the scares, all the terrors, and I found the herb. You can do the same thing. You want to set out? How many of you, the teacher is still talking to the class, how many of you want to set out? I'll walk to you and I'll tell you you'll be all right. If you can raise your hand, that's all right. You want to, now, I'm talking to you in this class in the clubhouse here. I'll take you to the edge of the jungle. I've, I've told you that it's safe. It is safe to enter the jungle, not dangerous. You're in danger where you are now. Will you take one step into it, two steps, five steps, ten steps? Bearing everything, enduring everything, if you will. You understand perfectly what I'm talking about. And you'll understand why I have to talk to you in certain ways. Because you'll understand your own fears, how you had to go through them. And when you find the, the healing herb, you will be healed and you'll come back here. And we'll sit around and, and be friends and talk about these things and urge anyone else who wants to go. And in this kind of a new kind of life, there's no false power. The false power that our vanity gave to us, in which we love to have people come to us. We love to have authority over other people, and we love to have their money. We love to have their praise, and we love to be written up. You know, we don't know. We don't know the agony that we're in when we're still excited about our fame and fortune in this world or our forthcoming fame and fortune. We don't know what agony we and see it now so that you don't waste all these years and then have to go back and start all over again. The sooner you start, the sooner you start, this is a fact, the easier it will become for you because you won't have to be melted down quite so much. The harder you get, the harder it is to be melted down. And most human beings will never get melted down because they've gone beyond the point where the warmth of truth can begin to melt them down. We're trying to catch ourselves while we still have a chance. See, let me tell you what's happening. See how everything connects. You won't, many of you, not all of you, you won't let me have my mind to myself because you don't want your mind to yourself. You don't want it. You don't value it. You want other, you want, you pray, you attract for the whole world to intrude into your private life so that you continue to live in your daydreams. You want that jangling phone to ring all day long with invitations and blabber mouths just to talk to you. And, and, and one of your little tricks will be to complain in class, my phone rings all day long and I don't know how to stop people. 
You want people to intrude into your life. You're afraid to have that phone stop ringing and those letters stop coming or people stop coming to your house. You do everything possible to get people to intrude into your mind. Peace of mind is the last thing you want. So you can't understand it if there should happen to be someone who doesn't want you to intrude because you, well, boy, is he unfriendly. Look at me, I'm social, I'm affable. I like to, I love people so much. I mix with people, I love people so much. I like to be among people. I like to share with them, you know the lie. The whole thing's a lie. You hate, sharers are haters. And contemptuous of those that come into their life and, and take up their invitation. There is a part of us, no matter how sick we are, that is not stupid. It is cunning, not intelligent, it's cunning. And it senses when it senses the weakness of other people who walk right into our trap, our invitation. It senses. And then it gets pleasure out of being secretly contemptuous of that person who walks into the trap. And you'll use them. You'll get everything you can. You'll get their money. You'll get anything you can. How what? Cunning, yes. Animals are very cunning, aren't they? You ever see a what a dog, a pointer? He's cunning. He knows you should stop. Don't attract attention now. Wait till they're looking away, then creep up. Dog, where are you calling it? I've seen this cunning fact about you know, the people, even little babies. It's called cunning. It's home to a very fine degree with everything, everything they disturb. Most people think that thought and mind are the same thing. Um, you know, thoughts are the sicknesses that grab hold of us, but a pure mind. Would you expand on that, please, when thoughts drop away? What's your name? Well, I've done it many times. Maybe for some of you, it'd be for the first time that you'll understand it. You have to have thoughts, or you wouldn't be able to exist on this earth. You have to have thoughts. But who said that I have to have a hateful thought, a cringing thought, a grasping thought? Who said I have to have thoughts that like to be agitated, that like to be agitated? You can say that. Do you know that it's possible just to, to think clearly at all times and not be not be carried away into the, the whirlpool of wrong emotion? So that when you think, you think purely, practically, absolutely, even in your in, for your own favor as far as the, this present existence is concerned, you can think clearly. And the clearer you think, the more you're you see how insane the world is. Go ahead. Um, There's a lot more, but go ahead. A friendly greeting, when you walk up to somebody and give them a friendly greeting, is that funny? Is that be funny also? What's your, what's your motive for it? Just to say hello. By the way, let me add something now that you brought it up, Rod. And I think I've said this before, but let me repeat it. Uh, we're all good friends here, huh? And uh, when we go out of here Friday night, we're all good friends, huh? When we come in Saturday morning, do we have to rush up toward each other and throw our arms around each other as if we've been separated for six years? I will promise you one thing, if you'll promise me one thing. I promise you that when we meet every time, and we've just seen each other the day before, so, I will promise you, if you don't come up and say good morning to me, I will not feel offended. Okay? Don't feel obligated to uh, make get it over with you know let's get it good morning or now you can go on you <laughs> i promise that i will you know reverse whatever the reverse was let's not feel offended if we don't come up and smile pleasantly each other which nothing has happened in, during the night we're still good friends <laughs> <laughs> larry the idea of friendliness is coming up and punching me and so much is coming me out i don't know what you're saying about <laughs> Okay. 
Yes, that's a different matter. You'd have a motive behind it to go up and say hello. Yes, Chuck. Do you remember how we did Debbie Bridges this morning? No, I'm trying to forget. You made a complete about page. I'll tell you another thing, in case it's lurking somewhere in your mind. If I give you an abrupt good morning or something like that, I still like you. You know, you understand? Or if I turn away when I see you coming, I still like you. There's nothing wrong, though, when new people come into class. If a lot of us would just make an effort to walk over to somebody and say, good morning, welcome to class, and so many people just breathe up the young through it. Like you did with this lady. Whatever. People just don't do it. Yes. Uh, you can only do that rightly when you understand everything else we've talked about. When you go up and say hello to someone, you're doing it with a right motive. Maybe the motive is to get over your own shyness. Or maybe you see that the other person is a little bit bashful. And, and you know, it's, it's very nice to be... Isn't it nice to have a friendly little spirit in here? Isn't that nice? Not to be big grouches like you are in the outer world. I saw Hanson. Yes, we fail to realize that everything you do all the time is conscious and it's a continuous lesson for us, no matter what it is. And you're watching me all the time, aren't you? Yeah. I know that if I reach over and pick up that coffee cup, you're all watching, aren't you? Now here's my next line. If I spill one drop, <laughs> half of you will leave the class. <laughs> Well, who doesn't want to admit it? Huh? Who's Richard? <laughs> of course you don't. You never will know. Because it changes, doesn't it? Fifty Richards. How terrible for the world, huh? <laughs> How terrible for so-called Richard, huh? Have you know, is that characteristic of the book-selling people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, customary announcement. Those of you who don't come to every class have no chance at all in this life. If you live at a distance, then there's an excuse. If you live in Reno, for example, there's an excuse. There's no excuse for any of you who live within a reasonable driving distance of this class. If you leave this class and you don't come back, you're lost. Keith, you have no chance in your present condition. Yes, not believing in your pseudo-self is protection. Danger is to believe in yourself, contrary to positive thinking principles, books. Don't believe in yourself, but you have to have made a little bit of progress in this to understand that. Don't believe in yourself. How many understand that? How many don't understand? Uh, go ahead, Jean. Say that last sentence again. If I would have believed in those thoughts, yes. I would have not been here. I, I understand. Yes, that's correct. And my people are Yeah, yes. Vernon, Vernon, I'll tell you why Vernon is here. Vernon is here for you to use rightly now. Have you ever read or ever heard of, ever since you were a little child going to Sunday school, 
you ever heard a phrase something like something like unlimited resources limitless power everlasting glory you're gonna run out how many people have you exhausted in your life so far how many people how's this one how many people have been exhausted through being in close contact with you as well as bored to death isn't it strange how we know that our relationship association with another person is harming us and we go right back the next day for more it's really really easy to figure out why you do that you can only travel horizontally and that's where all your friends are that's where all your excitements that's where all your resources are on the horizontal level where you are and the whole world goes around exhausting one another and what are you getting anyway can you tell me one good thing you've ever got from another human being all right I'll tell you what you got what you obtained <clears throat> were certain right things which are right as long as you're living in time it's just fine if you want to get married if you want to get married get married if you want to have a friend have a friend if you want to associate with these people or those people associate with them but they're going to come to an end and so are you and we're in this class to see <coughs> here for more than time benefits more than time rewards what a liberating fact to see that what you get from your wife husband friend club if you're foolish enough to belong to a club that it gives you only something for this life but if you believe in this life if you take this life as everything which you do this is the reason you keep going back time and time again you ladies don't raise your hand ladies but how many of you get mixed up with one idiotic man after another you men with it ladies likewise friends you some of you men some of you young people why do you go back to them during a war there was a soldier who was drafted in the army and because he used his mind well because he was intelligent resourceful adaptable he was called into the general's office one day and he walked in saluted the general and the general said we need a man to enter the enemy lines go into enemy country the enemy army and become one of them search out their installations their armies the size of the armies do everything that a spy does so he volunteered with some doubts about it but he obeyed orders so as he was leaving the office the general said now single most important thing I have to tell you is this and the general reached into his desk and he pulled out an envelope and he handed it to the spy soldier spy to take this envelope and when you get up in the airplane which is going to take you over to enemy over enemy lines going to drop you down I want you to read this envelope just before you drop and then leave it on the plane because obviously I don't want it to be seen by the enemy in case they capture you so the spy said fine get all prepared he got all his equipment all his 
parachutes, went up in the plane, plane flew on and on into the night. He had the envelope with him, it was to read, and then sat down leaving the plane just before he jumped. So as they got over enemy territory, the pilot yelled back a worried message to him that the weather was getting bad, storms were coming up, and he had better prepare for a rough landing in his parachute. So he looked out, and sure enough, it was starting to storm. And not being an expert parachuter, he was worried about that, how he might come out. So he went to the door, the pilot getting ready to give him the signal when to jump. And he was adjusting his equipment and thinking about the storm. The pilot said, jump, so he jumped. And just when he was halfway down, he remembered he hadn't looked at the envelope. He'd forgotten the instructions. It sent a, a chill through him. But he was committed now. There he was, right in the middle of 500 miles of enemy battlefields and camps and factories. Landed, hit his parachute, put on his first disguise. Worried, 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 because he had forgotten to follow the most important instructions that the general had given. Nevertheless, he was, and being a good soldier, put on his disguise and began gathering the information that had been assigned to him to gather. He went to an aircraft factory, disguised himself as a workman, went work for several days, made mental notes, came out, sent him back by radio transmission. Next day he went to near an army barracks, disguised himself as one of the enemy soldiers, and wandered around inside. And he made a mistake. A matter of saluting. You know, every army has their own particular salute. The French, something like that. The Americans like that. Something like that all salute different and it wasn't quite right just a little bit off because he wasn't he wasn't students thinking of what he was doing at the time he was doing it he forgot his mind was carried away with anxiety that he might get caught and he did captain came, the enemy captain came along with two or three of the men they stopped him they asked him questions and he had been, of course, briefed on what to say, how to answer, but they, they had their doubts. It didn't quite go over fully with him, so they put him in that stockade, which is an army jail, tending to question him later. And he's really worried now because he knew if they went any further, they'd find him out. They could check him out too easily. So he spent two or three nights in the jail, feeling that he'd failed. So on the fourth morning, he got up and he looked at the door, steel door to the cage, to a uh, cell. And he noticed something slightly different about it. And what he noticed is that the bolt had been withdrawn. So he went to the door and to his surprise, it pushed right open. So the spy pushed open the door, looked up and down the corridor, no one there looked at the direction that seemed to be the back of the barracks, went back there, no one around, a couple more doors were open, it went out, he found himself outside the camp. He was free, he escaped. So he began, resumed his spy activities, gathered a lot of information, kept sending it back. Went into a enemy town, went into a cafe, made another mistake of some kind with the right hand, the wrong hand, I think they usually have it in the spine movie, got caught again. Took him back to another one this time, not knowing he'd just previously escaped, took him back to another one. This time he was questioned by a lieutenant, fiercely. But right in the middle of the questioning, the lieutenant, who was asking all these first questions, suddenly got up and walked out of the room 
And the spy seen a, another door over there, which was unlocked, went over there, went outside, escaped again. He couldn't believe his good fortune, but he was still pretty sick, pretty worried. He'd been assigned there for six months. He'd been assigned there for six months, and only two weeks had passed so far. Over a period of the next several months, he did his work well, being a, a good soldier. But he made so many mistakes and got caught so many times, he, he wondered why he hadn't been executed by this time. You know the fate of spies in wartime. He had on different uniforms, different civilian clothes, been caught with a camera one time where he shouldn't have been caught with a camera at an aircraft factory. Managed to get away from him. He finished his tour, if you can call it that, of six months, very worried, deathly worried man. He'd done his work, he carried it out, he did his part. But he had heard too many stories about what happened when you get caught by the enemy and out of uniform. But he managed to work his way back, got caught once on the way back, managed to escape again when one of the enemy majors turned his back for a minute. He slipped away out into the woods. Off he went back. Finally got back to his home country. And when he crossed the line, he took a deep breath. And he wondered, he wondered how he ever could have survived how it had happened. He couldn't believe it. So he made his way back to his own army unit, went up to the general's office, was admitted, sat down opposite the general, and the general looked at him, and he looked at the general. <coughs> general said, you had it pretty rough, didn't you? And the I admitted it had been a terrible experience, tense all the time, nervous, worried about the knock, next knock on the door of his little apartment. He was tired. The general said, yes, I, I know, I understand. Being a spy is, takes a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of skill, a lot of alertness. Now, uh, soldier, may I tell you, the general continued, what made it so hard on you? And the spy began to think about the envelope. And he was wondering if there was a connection there. And the general nodded. He reached into his desk and pulled it out. And there was the original envelope that had been given to the soldier. And he handed it over to him. He said, read this. And of course, with a great curiosity, he tore open the envelope and read it. And what it said was this. It was in information saying that planted throughout all of the enemy territory were his own friendly soldiers who were also spies who were disguised as the enemy. And he read it once, he read it twice. Finally it dawned on him that captain, that enemy captain who'd left the room, he did it deliberately. He was deliberately letting him escape. And he thought of several other incidents where he'd barely made it out of their snares, barely got away, but had got away. And he understood why. He was with his own. See? See the application? Now, you, you listen to this. You're seated, seated before me now, listening to an interesting story, and you're going to go out of here unless you remember the instructions before you leave here. If you jump out of here before you remember the instructions, which I'm going to give you now for a while, if you forget those, you're going to be very worried, and you're going to feel very unsafe. And you're going to be worried over the knocks on the doors, and you're going to feel uncertain as to anything and everything you do. So here's the instructions. 
now. Well, look, it depends on whose side you're on in life. If you're on the side of what is true, of what is right, of what is honest, you know the rest of the virtues. If you're on the side of that, now you, you're going to have to think like you've never thought before. If you are really on the side of what is true, of what is right, how can you be in danger? You consider this world enemy territory, don't you? If you don't, you'd better. You are in enemy territory. You're surrounded by sick people, sick events. You're surrounded by your own thinking. You're surrounded by your own inadequacy in meeting the sickness out there. Right. So we're all in enemy territory. Don't you know, don't you understand at all that if you are really right when you get picked up when you get in a circumstance i'm telling you this is not a pretty story and don't you take it as one you know nothing is good in this class unless it's practical unless it's something you can take out that door and down to that office or that home don't you know that if you are really doing what is right doing what is that you will always be protected because you're in no other place except under the protection of what is true. And that's the whole story. But you have to be there to know it. You have to have read the message. You have to get all these spiritual principles so that when you, you parachute into the enemy country, and look, you're walking down the road in a uniform of the enemy, the spy, and the troop comes along in the truck, and the, the colonel stops the truck and thinks you're a deserter, or he wants to question you. <coughs> when that truck rolls up, and you see all these men in their steel helmets and their rifles, and then Colonel who loves to exercise his authority, of course. And they stop you and they surround you and ask you questions. You don't have to be like them. Knowing the instructions, knowing that you, you have the rightness inside of you, knowing that it's inside of you, how can you be afraid of anything outside of you? See, if the circumstances of this world, if the follies of this world are not in you, if you're not letting someone, what can you be afraid of? When you really wake up, when you're surrounded by all these, these soldiers who have captured you, you will, you will know something that one man in a billion knows which is that you're standing there being questioned and you know that they are the nervous ones, not you. You know that. Can you, can you conceive a situation where you're surrounded by a mad world and you answer their question because that's on the level of, of, of verbalization. They ask you a question, you answer it. Yes, officer, yes, whatever. You answer the question. But you're in so complete understanding, you know that the one who's trying to intimidate you because they're asleep, you know that they're the nervous ones. And you stand there very calmly and talk to them. Because the friendly forces that we talked about, that captain, that was an illustration, of course, and the colonel and the others who were on your side, they're all inside you. They can't leave you. They won't leave you. This is what this is what is meant. 
God will protect you at all times. You know, I know, I know very well that you take that as religious talk. And the reason you take it as, as religious talk is because you've never personally experienced it. You can't go out and into that world. You can't parachute right down in the middle of it and go where you want to go, do anything you want to do, and not be scared of it all because you really know you're protected. You're protected because there's no enemy. Let's see. Let, let's, let's do something again. If I ask you to name your enemy, that's the trouble. I ask you to tell me what who is threatening you and you'll tell me which is the trouble you believe in it you verbalize it you create it you love it you maintain it you feed it if I tell you that it's not necessary to protect yourself against the world, what would you think of that? You know what would think. Everything in you that's ever been scared by the world or by yourself, everything in you would begin to react, would begin to leap up and say, I'm in danger. Come on now, look, look. How can truth but see, the trouble is you don't know truth. It, I, it's so very difficult to talk with you. I don't make assumptions. How can truth, capital T, which is all-powerful, which never, never, never creates an enemy, which is complete in itself, which is whole, which has no tendency on anything outside itself, how can that tremble? But what I said doesn't make much sense to you because you can only hear it as words. And I'll tell you, I'm not repeating, merely repeating in the usual way that you used to hear it in Sunday school and in church, repeating the, the proverbs, the aphorisms, that you can walk through this world, this wicked world, and not be touched and not be hurt. I'm telling you, I'm telling all of you here personally, I'm telling you that it's a fact. This world can't touch you unless you've got the world in you. If you get the world in you, that's the friend that you have chosen. And that friend is going to betray you. You can't imagine it and you can't believe it. Such a different way than going out the door even tonight and seeing all the insanity around you. And, and poor pathetic little people and you know what you ask, not even knowing you're asking. You're asking, how can I protect myself? How can I earn a living? They make it so hard to earn a living. How, how can I be liked? How can I be accepted? How can I feel secure? Everywhere, wherever I look, it's, it is insanity. There's pressure. You walk down the street, and that man looks at you in a certain way, or that woman looks at you in a certain way, or that group or that authority with their uniforms, or their judges' robes. You feel pretty oppressed, huh? Oh, what a mistake you're making. What a price, what a price you pay every hour for being you. Of course, you're the victim of the world. You're the victim of the world because you're the persecutor of the world. 
What you get from the world, you would like to do under the world. And don't you lie to me about that. I know it's a fact, whether you do or not. I know that if you feel viciousness from another person, if it hurts you, I know that you're vicious and you want to hurt the other person. You don't do it, of course, all the time, outwardly, because you want something from that other person. Or you want something from that organization. Or you want to just play it safe and make people think you're nice. You want to stop paying the price? Then stop being you. Let's see if I can summarize everything up to this point. There is, for each of you in this room and hearing this tape, there is a unique, invisible type of second by second protection How's this? Don't miss the next sentence. There is a unique, all-powerful protection from you. What dangers you are to yourself. Look at the way your mouth runs on. Look at the way your thoughts chase each other around all day today. Look at your fault concern for other people. Look how, you, look how you strain and wish that things could be different. Repeat. Look how you strain anxiously and almost cry or do cry and say, if only people were nicer, if this world were sane, if only things were different. And you go around like that, and knowing that you do it all day long, and torment yourself. You better impress yourself with the fact tonight that you need all the protection you can get from yourself. That's the danger. You, <clears throat> you have no other danger in this whole universe outside of the way you now think. You have no danger at all outside of the way you now feel, you now live. There's no danger at all. Why don't you prove to yourself, for yourself, the truth of what I've just told you? Well, you understand that your worry and your concern is very valuable to you. And as many, many times as I told you to stop torm tormenting yourself, to worrying over anything at all, you continue to do it. Because your present dark nature, which is pretty black, you tell me, how can it want anything of the light? How can your weakness how can your weakness, and I see it in your faces right now, how can your, your doubting nature want something that's very, very strong and sure? It can't. And you're never going to train your weakness. You're never going to train your weakness to be strong. You're never going to teach it to be other than what it now is. What you can do is get up and walk away from it. You can say, I am not going to have a conversation with that man or that woman anymore. And I'm not going to have a conversation in which I am I am talking to that person weakly and scared and wanting something from him or her and hoping and praying that he or she or that organization will be kind to me. I am sick and tired of wanting you to be nice to me. I am not going to stand and talk to you and hope that you'll treat me kindly and gently. 
I'm not going to do it anymore. Instead, I'm going to watch myself the next time I talk to you in all that weakness, hoping that you're going to say the right thing that pleases me, that makes me feel secure. I'm going to watch myself listening for your word of comfort, and I'm going to turn around and walk away. And I'm not going to anyone else either. I'm going right out in the middle of that lot over there. I'm going to stand there all alone. And I'm not going to have one of you here in this room as my friend. You're not going to give me another thing you never did. Now I see it. That's why I don't want any more. I don't want your friendship or your kindness or your money or your gift or your sex. I'm tired of being scared, see? And I didn't know it, but I was in enemy territory when I was talking with you and wanting you to behave in a way that pleased me. I didn't know I was in enemy territory without strength of my own when I wanted the group to give me something, when I wanted to be surrounded by friends and having a nice dinner together with you. I didn't know how weak I was. I forgot the instructions. But now I know something better. I'm going I'm to read those instructions, not just once or twice, but endlessly. So it begins to get through to me that I can be right in this world, talking to you, and we can be friends on a social level and all that. I'm not going to be scared anymore. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid that you're going to find me out anymore. You go ahead and find me out all you want, for heaven's sake. You go ahead and see through me 100%. I don't care anymore. I'm not going to protect anything anymore. I'm not going to be anyone anymore. myself so that I'm not divided, so I'm not saying one thing and thinking another. Oh boy. Then I can walk out into that lot and be all alone, all alone out in that lot out there and feel safe, feel right, know that I'm awake. Then, then, if I want Natu I'm not compelled, but if I want to, I'll come over that lot, and I'll come in this room, and I'll talk to you, and I'll talk to you, and I'll talk to you. But whether I'm out there, or whether I'm right in here, I know where I am. N nothing, nothing outside of me can intimidate me or terrify me. Knowing that I'm on the side of rightness, Nothing can touch me. Let's do take a break and we'll come back for questions and answers. All right. Now don't you get out of this. It is either true that you can live in this shuddery world without shuddering yourself or it isn't true. Now, to you, as you presently live, it is not a truth to you. It is not a fact to you. So I have to ask you a question which will utterly confuse you. Do you want to find out for yourself one way or the other, whether it is true or not that you can live without shudders, 
Do you want to? Well, do you want to? All right, what are you doing in your 24 hours of the day to confirm your affirmative answer? Do you suspect that there are all kinds of intimidators inside of you that you don't know about yet? that you so can easily agree that you want to find out for yourself or not, whether I've told you the truth or not. I know I have. And you, you suspect that I have. You, you don't know. You suspect. What good is it going to do you and you and you and you? <clears throat> what good is it going to do you to come here night after night, month after month, and hear me say that you need not shudder, and you nod your head, well, that's good, that's what I want, but you don't change inwardly. You have not said with great explosive emotion, right kind of liberating emotion, you haven't said, among other things, what I said to you towards the last of the talk tonight, which is say to yourself, equally to the world, you go right ahead and see through me all you want. I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm not going to pretend I'm decent that I'm intelligent, that I'm in control of myself, because I know I'm not. As a matter of fact, I pray, I plead, see through me, expose me as the faker that I am, so that I have a chance. Don't be nice to me. I fell for that all these years. And look what we did to each other. Now, you, can you say that with equal emotion yourself and mean it that I'll tell you? If you have this right feeling, this right energy, you will, you will sense your own right meaning right while you do it, while you say it. You feel so good that you're doing something right for yourself. See, look, if everyone sees through you, I'm not talking about exposing your private life. I mean, I'm talking about these fakeries that we go around with, and I think you can see the difference. If you see through me, you see that I'm a phony. You see that I pretend I'm so smart and I'm intellectual and I know so much. If you see through me, and if I see through me, that settles the matter. Thank heaven that settles it. That's the end of it. You see through me, period. I don't have to do a thing. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to get mad at you for seeing through me. That settles it. I'm a fake. What will arise from that pure knowledge of your fakery is something beautiful, is something new, something powerful, something that conquers the whole world. Now you know what you have to do. No more protection, no more phony protection. You have to be seen through, and when you've seen through yourself utterly, you're protected utterly. Please, please, use every ounce of energy you have from now on to see through yourself, and then stop right there. No comment. Any comment on your fakery seen through yourself will wreck it. Any addition to it will keep it going. 
I'm a fake and I know it. And there's great rest in that. You'll, so, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now I don't have to strain anymore. Now I don't have to try. Now I, now I, I, I understand. If I keep trying the way I used to try, I will fail because I always did not, always will, therefore I'm not going to try anymore. Therefore the fear of failure vanishes because I'm not even trying to succeed anymore. Try to succeed in being intelligent and being someone and being successful and being a leader. My absence of effort means the absence of fear. All of this is extremely spiritual, rightly. All right, you're on for questions and comments. Very relaxedly, no? Your thoughts are your worst enemy. That'll help a little bit, won't yeah. it? The way you think. Yes. Can you think of, remember a thought, one, just one out of a 10,000 days, that you thought that was an enemy thought? Yes. Did you get mad and stuff like that? Yes. Or just the danger. Okay, enemy. sure. Yeah. All right. That's what your worst enemy is. You. You and your thoughts are yeah. the same thing. Uh, yes, John. Yes, yes, right. And we have to use the word effort, but the time comes when you see that there is such thing as right effort and wrong effort. And right effort is to not do wrong effort. <laughs> Look, you get up in the morning and you say, ah, I have to associate with me all day long. <laughs> Isn't that really what you're saying? I have to run around with me all day long. How unpleasant. Well, why don't you change your nature so that you, so that you like being what this new nature is, which is not your personal possession, and neither is your old nature, by the way. But you think it is. You think it is. And that thinking creates the delusion that it's your identity. Are any of you beginning to suspect after all these talks that you are not who you think you are? Is it beginning to dawn a little bit? And also, you're increasingly aware of how the, the battle starts when you suspect this. How you don't want to know anymore. Go real slow, the devil's whispering. Go real slow. Or you're going to be in trouble. Why don't you talk back and say, what do you mean, be, and I already am. I have to make a continuous, uh, constant effort to be considerate of other people. And I no. have a tendency to treat them like I treat myself, which is thoughtless. There's a lot of strain in you and pleasing other people, is there not? You're not really pleasing them, you know. Do you know unless you could unless you're pleasing yourself, you can't please another person. Now take this leap. The pleasing of yourself in the right way. The pleasing of yourself in the right way will displease most people. Right, you get that, Larry? Yes, Larry, Larry nodded so emphatically, I think you got it. It seems like when we comfort other people and we are comforted, when we please other people and we are pleased by them, when we uh, praise other people, we are praised by them, when we prop up other people's haunted houses and they prop up our haunted houses, that this is the horizontal level you're talking about. Well, we're not going anywhere. Yes.
you know that the ghosts in the haunted house don't know that they're ghosts? You tell a ghost that he's one, he won't hear you. And that's why it continues. The ghosts in you don't know they're ghosts. They call themselves entities of a different kind. And they even, in your presence, call themselves friends. Ghosts make full use of the distortion of words to might try to make you think that they are what they claim to be, even though they don't believe it themselves. A ghost to you, if you're beginning to wake up, is a word, a word. But you don't go from the word to the emotion and the imagination and the memory of past experiences to create what you call a reality. You say the word ghost and you know that it's a word. And when you know it's a word, it doesn't go further into causing a fearful reaction in you. A ghost, for example, of that bad behavior of 10, 20, one year ago. Remember it? Do you remember it? See? If you see it as the word, the ghost word, and don't go beyond that, it can't go back into time thinking and do time feeling, time imagination, time memory and you're free of it. You're free of go you, you are chained, haunted. <clears throat> you're haunted by ghosts because you create them, because you're more comfortable with them and wouldn't know what to do, Lila, if they went away and left you. You would feel lonely. So now do you see the way out? You have to depart from your ghost painful as it is, as sad as you are, which when you see what they're doing, it doesn't become sad at all, it becomes a great delight. And I have to use the figure of speech of saying you go from them, but in truth, in fact, they go from you. They can no longer find a home in your house because it's becoming a palace instead of a haunted house. Ghosts, ghosts are miserable and hateful if they are floating around at night, hoo-hooing around at <laughs> night. And if they, if in, if in their unconsciousness they flit into a castle window, they immediately feel uncomfortable. And they hate anything and everything they see in there, and they look for the nearest door. like a friend. I've got my day planned. Thank you, ghost. I'm going to go through my day mournful. Especially when I meet other people. You ever notice your act break down when you get all alone? It's not worth it to do it to yourself, right? <laughs> audience is much nicer. <laughs> uh, left 
alone in my room as a young girl, um, ghosts would attack me then and make me think uh, that the whole carpet was full of bugs on the floor. That's, that's true. That's very true. Children are victims of evil spirits, very much so. How many of you were ever children? <laughs> you know that. Remember when you were alone in that house for a little bit, your parents went out, you know, shopping or something like that? You were all alone, you heard a sound, you crawled under the bed till they came back, something like that. That's evil spirits. That's what it is, isn't it? And it's uh, lighter now, but it wasn't funny then, was it? Go ahead, Jim. But if you want to see the evil spirits at work, if you just park sometimes at an uh, elementary school and watch the kids and how they, you know... More detail. How they'll pick on, you know, they'll all pick on one kid. Or oh, they're like cruel. Kids are cruel. About junior high age, they begin to see the pleasure of cruelty. Pleasure in cold marks. And how few ever outgrow it. Now they're cruel with a suit and tie on. Or in the name of discipline. <coughs> Sharpen your powers of perception so that you can recognize an evil ghost when he appears in the smallest way in human behavior. Make an exercise of this. Now you remember what I'm saying. Now here's the exercise. Watch people in the grocery line, driving the car, people walking in front of your house. Watch and see if you can detect the emergence of the ghost who's been inside there all the time, but he flutters out just a little bit with a certain intonation of the voice, kicking a rock out of the street, angrily kicking a rock out of the street and he almost tripped his trip on something like that. Catch it at the start and you'll be catching it all day long and not necessarily in what we call the aggressive ghost-like characteristics but the defensive ones. Beware, beware of people with wet eyes. Yes. Yeah right in this room that's defensive ghostliness there's hostility in that what's the timid the timid little do you know that that's a ghost that timid little remark that person is weak then you'll be able to once you see that, then you'll be able to tell whether that person who is ghostly, either aggressively or passively, also has something else in him or her that's worth working with. You'll be able to tell. Be able to tell by how they answer you when you say something to them. Whether, whether they take the bait when you start talking about these principles, for example. Oh, uh, uh, yes, Lila. My ghost has difficulty looking you in the eyes. Say that again. A ghost has difficulty looking you straight in the eyes. Looking who in the eyes? You or whoever. Anybody else, too? Well, it's not a virtue just to stare at people when you're conversing with them. Why don't you just relax and look around, you know, you look at them. There's the natural way to talk with people, isn't there? But when your eyes meet, why should you be uncomfortable? I think my eyes will meet some of you here. 